Wonderful. So I am going to kickstart the discussion. I don't want to put you guys in a spot, but I'm going to ask you a very fun question to begin with. So the fun question that I would have for each one of you would be, so you would need a mic? So uh, we just need one more mic. Yeah. So the fir first fun question that I would have actually for you would be that if you were not in corporate, if you were not, let's say, working for a bank or maybe, you know, an agency or, you know, in, in the corporate, what else would you have done? In, in terms of the career. I, I can start first. I mean, if not in corporate, I would definitely would love to have my own food truck. That is something which I kind of plan to do post my retirement. So, Flame, let, let's kind of kick start it with you. Hello. Sure, should I go? Sorry? You can go for yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. um, so, the, the funny part about this is, right, um, I've tried to do quite a few different things through the span of my career. But one way or the other, all of those jobs or all of those roles pull me back to sales or marketing in one way or the other. So you can run, but you can't really hide from sales or marketing. But if it were a very, very little uh, question, right, I'd probably be in a coffee estate somewhere. Okay. Interesting. Flame? Yeah, I think similar to, to Ashish, I've done a few different things, but always ended up in marketing at the end of the day. But if I were to pick something completely random, I would probably want to be like, an archaeologist, but, but only if it's one like Indiana Jones. <laughs> Ashish? Uh, yeah, so for me, again, I love uh, the industry I'm in, marketing and the intersection of marketing and technology. Uh, but what I would have really loved to do would have been maybe be a movie critic. Uh, because I love movies, analyzing them, and like spending, watching it for like three hours and spending like 10 hours to kind of analyze that from every different aspect and reading about it. So I would have loved to be part of that one. Great. You get to know a lot about people if they're not part of the corporate, they, what are the different things that they would do, but great insights there. So I'm going to kickstart with the same theme that we were talking about being customer centric, right? So um, during economic challenges, right, understanding customer behavior is kind of very crucial. And uh, one of the questions that I would like to put forward for Ani and Flame actually would be that, uh, how have you adapted, you know, your customer uh, acquisition and retention strategy during like tough economic times, if you can share it with the audiences? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I'll kick us off. So uh, tough economic times, right? We've seen back-to-back uh, -back tough economic times, either uh, the current macroeconomic situation or uh, COVID that just, uh, you know, past and it's in the past, stays there. So uh, uh, what, what I generally tend to believe in is having an always on program of some sort in some way that's continually doing the best, uh, uh, like working towards the best outcomes both from a business as well as a customer perspective. So this always on approach gives us the ability to work with uh, like good partners who are able to bring their understanding and their skill sets across various, uh, what do you call, uh, domains to then bring it to fruition from a customer centricity perspective. Now, uh, bringing this back to the customer and how we're able to cope despite these challenges, right, is to use the various formats, uh, various platforms of various data points that we have across the paid media channels, whether it's uh, across the digital analytics channels or even uh, from other data sets themselves to then, uh, follow the customer, to pick up leading and lagging, lagging indicators, to then say what's where's the customer's mind at, what are they planning to do, when are they going to make a pivot, and then uh, roll along with that pivot, to then meet them where they are, to get that outcome. Interesting. Flame, your perspective on the same as well? Right. Yeah, I think especially, you know, as you mentioned, in challenging times nowadays, one of the things that we as a brand have to do is always continue to adapt. Mm -hmm. So. Just because something was working well last year, just because this was the way that customers were behaving, but nowadays even technology is moving so fast, the way customers interact with our brand is moving very fast. It's always changing, so for us it's more about being able to identify the trends and make changes along with that. And then of course, together with that, making sure we are creating the correct segments within our audience so that we can you know, connect with them with the right message even if it's something different than it previously used to be. 
wonderful. And I mean, Ashish, you have been on the other side of the business as well, right? Like you would have been working with a lot of customers and kind of helping them kind of understand user behavior. So from your perspective as well, during tough times or economic tough times, like what was some of the suggestions or strategies that you recommended? Uh, I think uh, it has, uh, from what Anu was also mentioning, uh, not stopping your efforts in terms of reaching out to the customers, uh, because uh, there have been few examples uh, where the few brands stopped the spending and they could have seen, immediately they could see uh, the short term, they, see, they have seen the gains, but in the long term they have seen the user go away because uh, they couldn't see the marketing efforts from the brand. So I think uh, our suggestions to the brands were, were always have been like, you always need to engage with your customers no matter what. You maybe need to kind of uh, reduce the amount of uh, <coughs> marketing that you're doing, but you need to engage with them always. Sure, thank you. And get, I mean, having that segue, right? Like today when we talk about app marketers or digital marketers in general, um, you know, they are spoiled with choices, right? We have seen phenomenal rise of, uh, you know, platforms, uh, I mean, ways in which, for example, programmatic, digital billboards, and even for that matter, you know, connected television. So uh, I'll kick start with you, Ashish. Like how uh, have, you know, previously in your experience, you have kind of uh, worked and understood how, what value do these platforms bring to the table? How do you measure uh, the impact of that? Because this kind of touches the budget allocation for a lot of marketers as well. So your thoughts on the same? Great question on that. Uh, so basically, what uh, we always had that difference uh, of calling marketing brand marketing versus performance marketing, uh, and there have been this thing recently that there is nothing called as brand and performance marketing. It should all be performance marketing. Even brand has have to deliver the performance. Uh, maybe the way we see that <coughs> or how we evaluate might be different, but uh, even the brand dollars have to hit the performance targets. Uh, so now, uh, whenever we think of, uh, say, app marketing, uh, app engagement, user acquisition, we always think of channels which, uh, <coughs> which drive the last mile conversions. Uh, and we prefer those, uh, even our attribution models and measurement are kind of uh, skewed towards measuring those channels. So when we basically see a channel like CTV, mm -hmm. uh, where people are spending most of the time in a day, uh, or uh, the new evo evolving mediums like digital out of home. So when we see these channels from the perspective of the way that we are measuring uh, user acquisition, you will not. You will always see that okay, they are not performing, and then you uh, will try to reduce the investment over there. So uh, I see this is where basically we need to understand how different channels are engaging with each other. Uh, so basically, uh, how, say, your CTV campaigns are driving your search volumes. So say your search campaign was not scaling, and suddenly one day it started scaling. What is the reason for that? The reason might be you started an OH campaign, you started a CTV campaign, and that drove interest and increased the search volume. So, so we need to understand how these different channels uh, interact with each other, influence each other, and then measure the impact at the overall level and not just looking at like, okay, how much this channel is driving for me. So uh, that kind of analysis, I believe we should be looking at when we are evaluating channels across spectrum. Wonderful. And uh, Flame, you, you have been, and you are a performance marketer, right? So when, when you hear about these different channels that are available, you know, as a performance marketer, so any thoughts on the same from your perspective? Yeah, I think as a performance marketer in general, I'm probably always looking for, for new channels to explore just, just for fun. So I, I think, as you mentioned, if you look at something purely from a cost per acquisition point of view, then it can be a bit difficult to attribute some of the, the more impression-based or view-based kind of categories where we do run our, our, our ads. So something that has actually been very helpful is using a more data-driven attribution model, whereas you're not only looking at just the last click, but kind of the entire user journey from the first touch point they actually had with your brand till the time they you know, looked at it again, till the time they converted and you know, came back again, loyalty and, and basically the whole customer cycle. 
And Anirudh, I mean, you, you work from the digital analytics side of things, right, for, yeah, yeah. for OCBC Bank. So all of these channels when, you know, your team must be coming and kind of saying, hey, these are the different channels that we want to explore. So is it data-driven decision definitely for, for you to kind of see? Not, not just my team. Actually, I'm ex-agency. So I've yeah. been there. I've been on the agency side. I've been on the publisher side. I've done a few things, like I said earlier. So uh, depends on what, what end of that spectrum you are, right? If you think of that triangle, uh, it's essentially you're trying to... Uh, balance the same equation but you have different perspectives firstly now now that I'm on the client side and uh, you know we're talking about new channels as uh, both of them have said uh, th this space is not clear it's not as straightforward as being able to make a decision but the point that both of them said was experimentation right you've got to see what works for you so always uh, have an open mind to experiment and uh, bring that data-driven thinking into your channel selection your channel mix your choice of channel itself and then go from there Absolutely. And um, talking about, you know, digital marketing, right, there have been a lot of changes which have come into the picture. And one of the things which is, I would say, the hot buzzword is, was privacy, almost like thanks to, you know, changes made by Apple and Google, and especially like we, they rolled, rolled out ADT and, you know, for Google uh, rolling out privacy sandbox. So if, you know, Ashish, from your perspective, like, uh, how do you see measurement strategy kind of evolving in the wake of these changes, especially, if, you know, when you're working with app marketers and digital marketers out there? So this kind of connects back to my previous question also. So uh, uh, this these changes are really great from the consumer perspective, from the user perspective. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, changes give us an opportunity to kind of transform the way we think of measurement. Uh, we need to move from, say, attribution to measurement. So when, when I say attribution, it's more of like, okay, which channel gets what allocation versus measurement, like, are these channels driving value or not? So I see this as an opportunity. So rather than thinking of incremental changes of like, okay, how can I use, uh, say, SCAD or any other solution that will give me the same output that was giving me before, to a new way of thinking where I'm thinking of what channels are driving what value uh, in the long term. Uh, can I do any kind of cohort analysis to understand that? Uh, how do I understand the value that each channel is bringing, similar to what I said last time, like how ch one channel is influencing the other channel. So I think with all these new changes coming in, we are at a position where we can basically think of how we transform the way we think about measurement rather than basically trying to find those incremental changes uh, and those solutions uh, which will be available with this. So uh, basically thinking about uh, whether those channels are driving value rather than basically thinking uh, whether I'm getting that uh, conversions and right CPI or not. So this is the point for us to move beyond those metrics and try to think of more long-term uh, user engagement uh, and more detailed analysis. So that's what I believe uh, we have an opportunity now to basically go and change the way we think about attribution and measurement. Thank you, Ashish. Flame, your perspective on the same as well, because you know, as an app marketer, right, a lot of these changes kind of di directly impact you know, your user acquisition strategies for, for the company. So how, how, how are you dealing it at your organization? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I definitely agree that user privacy is totally the buzzword right now, and I think marketers around the world are still, still trying to figure out how exactly to navigate the new landscape. I, I would say that probably one of the first things that we can do is, is to, to begin leveraging our first party data and starting with that. And the next thing is not just only depending on you know, one certain measurement tool, but probably a you know, combination of different tools, then at least you can get a more, a more complete and comprehensive idea of what's going on you know, with, with your app and with your analytics. And then, obviously, you know, testing different things to make sure what you're getting is as accurate as can be. Absolutely. Thanks. And um, Anirudh, I mean, this again kind of concerns, uh, you know, uh, the same industry because for banking industry, I would say, you know, user privacy is, you know, it's a two-fold approach, not just the new user acquisition um, aspect of it, but even the existing users that are there, you know, their privacy as well. So. Uh, from your standpoint, like how has that kind of how how have you made any changes, especially strategies, to kind of be to cope with it? 
Yep, yep. So, uh, uh, first off, right, like I think privacy is a uh, concern for all of us. I don't think, uh, like, uh, unfortunately that uh, it's the, uh, what do you call, cell phone manufacturers that are taking this into their own hands and no one else, but uh, uh, th there's more to come. I'm sure there's more that's happening there. there. And there's a lot of data that's coming out of our phones and uh, that's easily available to a bunch of people. So, there's more regulation to come and that's uh, good from a user perspective, but as a marketer, tough life. Uh, as much as we'd like to think, you know, uh, bullseye, 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 I'm going to be able to find the person I want at the right time, at the right place, and give them the right message. Uh, without access to that data and uh, uh, in real time, you're not going to be able to do that. So you've got to be more creative, uh, really put your marketing hat on and start thinking about different ways of achieving this. And as, as both uh, Ashish and Flame have said, right, there's a few different approaches in terms of measurement itself and what you could do from a first party data perspective. Uh, I'd want to bring in the third tangent or a fourth tangent as well there to say, hey, think about the channel of uh, communication itself. It, your customers are everywhere. We're a bank. There, there's multiple touch points that uh, you know our customers try to reach out to us from and that we try to reach out to them with. So if uh, one door is closed, there's always going to be another door that's open and you're going to be able to find a way to you know, uh, make, make contact. And once you've made contact, you've just got to make sure you're relevant and current and you know, outcomes generally tend to improve. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this also gets, in, gets us into the segue, right? Like as we talked about privacy, and I'll kickstart it with, um, you know, Anirudh, from your standpoint, that one of the other topics which, I mean, I would say, you know, has been a headache for app marketers is fraud, right? So when you're kind of, you know, attracting more users, you know, there's a lot of app uh, fraud that's happening. So uh, just taking a cue from your side, like what are some of the strategies that you have implemented at, at your organization to prevent that? Easy answer, Manish. Choose the right partner. Uh, <laughs> talk to adjust. Exactly. Uh, no, jo joke, jokes apart, like, uh, absolutely right. You've got to have uh, the right tools, the right team uh, around you to start. But um, uh, outside of that, right, uh, yeah, from a strategic perspective, we tend to be conservative. We're a bank. We bring that same uh, conservative mentality even in terms of media buying itself. Um, so outside of the wall gardens, right, we generally tend to be quite wary of what media we buy, how we buy it, what are we getting for it, and how do we evaluate that we're, you know, uh, getting what we paid for. Uh, to simply put, uh, but when when we want to play safe, yeah, obviously, I, as most people in this room would be doing, would be going to the wall gardens and like giving them their dollar to say, can you give me this outcome and so on and so forth. Um, that doesn't discount the fact that you know, with great tools come uh, great uh, what do you call insights in terms of what's happening from a from an ad ecosystem perspective. So being able to understand that will probably give you a better understanding of how to optimize those channels themselves, walled or otherwise. And yeah, I, I'd probably uh, use that with uh, the capabilities of tools in terms of fraud prevention and so on and so forth to get more from it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Flame, from your perspective as well, because I think fraud uh, prevention, uh, you know, they, they say, you know, uh, prevention is a good offense, you know, in, in that way. So taking your cue from the same as well, that when you're running your user acquisition strategies without disrupting the good users, so how have you implemented, let's say, fraud prevention strategies, or what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I think pretty much just any app campaign you run, there's always going to be an element of fraud involved mm -hmm. on some you know, platforms more so than others. So something I've, I've actually found is, I mean, obviously you have to implement things in, in your sign-up process, like your 2FA or something to you know, make sure that people are you know, human, <laughs> but as to not disrupt the rest of the process, basically going out of your way to streamline the whole sign-up process. So if the sign-up process is as easy and straightforward for the end user as possible, then they are less likely to be put off by any extra security measures that you have in place. And then aside to this, pretty much always need to have some sort of you know, click fraud or app fraud tool running as well to minimize the amount of fraud you are receiving and of course, improve the, the results of your campaign and, and your marketing budget. Absolutely. So if there are kind of solutions available in the market, it makes prudent for, you know, companies to kind of, you know, have those solutions in place to kind of prevent that. Um, Ashish, from your standpoint as well, because, you know, in your experience when you work with different, you know, especially B2C companies which have app, so... I mean, how does at an agency level, like what are the recommendations and strategies you recommend um, 
to kind of you know avoid fraud and kind of uh, yeah so similar to what ani said it's basically working with the right partners mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it doesn't just stop with say we are using a platform x so let's just and that platform has x amount of capabilities to identify these things but at the same time relying on third party tools as well that yeah whatever i am getting from platform x i won't just rely on that i will also use the third party measurement tool to know whether that platform whether they are talking right or not whether they are giving me right data so basically uh, do, this cross validation is really important uh, and it uh, doesn't uh, it's not just about app fraud or click fraud. We also need to look at, uh, it might not be fraud, but whether it's driving impact or not. So nowadays, there is a lot of talk about made for advertising websites. So that, technically, it's not a fraud. But then at the same time, you also need to know that these are systems built to kind of uh, as a hack in the system and not exactly driving value. So all these factors combined together, uh, we kind of uh, suggest our uh, clients, brands, uh, and obviously, working with the right partners is the uh, and multiple partners is the right way to go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is the last question that I have, and there might be some overlap in terms of the answers because the question actually would be that there would be a lot of um, you know digital marketers and app marketers sitting here. So, what would be some of the tips uh, that you would like to give to the audiences to drive that incremental value, keeping measurement also uh, in line? So. From, from your yeah, standpoint? I'll, I'll probably keep it uh, short and sweet. Um, it's uh, keep it simple, uh, simple strategies and exec executable strategy. If you can execute the strategy, you can hope for an outcome. The second one is don't not uh, discount the power of incrementality or compounding like small wins. It's just all about small wins. As long as you can get small wins regularly uh, over a medium term, long term, you're doing really, really well. And more importantly, irrespective of any pandemic or macroeconomic, uh, uh, what do you call headwinds that you might face, the method will solve for these complexities. Thank you. Uh, Flame, your, your, some tips for, for the audiences? Yeah, I think probably my, my, my best tip for any app campaign or marketing campaign in general is to always keep testing. Don't just have one thing that you're doing, but you know, have your split test, do your A-B test, see how things are working. Even if it's just small changes that each test is making, the, the more you do that, the more you can improve and slowly optimize your campaigns for better results. Excellent. And Ashish? Um, so uh, I'll say first and foremost start with the right metric. Uh, what is the right KPI and what is the right way to measure? Uh, then invest in basically that infrastructure to, basically, to capture and measure this in a correct way. Uh, and uh, uh, then after that, it's all about uh, understanding the incrementality that it is driving and doing the test and learn. And then making sure that we document all these changes because that's the most critical part. We don't just forget, but like make sure it's being documented and used in every subsequent campaigns. Thank you so much. Uh, I would have loved to continue this chat and continued with the same, but I, I know there is one more session and we don't want the team, um, you know, be kept before the dinner and drink.